Welcome to Worldwide Business. I'm Kathy Ireland. A trending topic in the aviation industry is the increased number of flight accidents and near misses. This growing concern has led pilots to consider proper upset prevention and recovery training. Flight Research is a company devoted to enhancing the safety of flight operations. Chairman and CEO Bill Corner is here to give us more details. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. It's great to be here, Kathy. Bill, could you please tell us what is the leading cause of aviation accidents and fatalities today? The leading cause of aviation accidents and fatalities in virtually every class of aircraft mm -hmm. is loss of control. Now, let me define what loss of control is. Loss of control is a situation where a structurally and mechanically sound aircraft is flying along. Right. It hits some type of an abnormal in-flight condition. Could be weak turbulence, that type of thing. Instantaneously and immediately, which causes a great startle factor for the crew, the autopilot is disengaged if it's an air carrier. The aircraft is thrown to the edge or beyond where it was designed to fly, what we refer to as the flight envelope. And that is also typically accompanied by an unusual attitude, meaning a roll attitude, a pitch attitude, whatever it may be. The pilot then has a very short period of time to understand what happened and to take corrective action. If they don't do the right thing, that ends up being a loss of control accident. And the problem is that the trend for loss of control accidents is increasing, not decreasing. The National Transportation Safety Board has listed it as their number one concern, most wanted concern. And the trend is going the wrong way. And particularly of concern is the fact that when we look at the aviation industry today, there are a lot of demands for new pilots because the older guys are retiring. There's a projection, a study that says about 70,000 new pilots will be required in North America. Most of those pilots will be trained in civilian schools where they don't have the aircraft or the money or the time to teach these kinds of skills. And so our concern is that unless we get all pilots trained in this kind of thing, this, this trend will, will likely continue. And we think uh, this training should be mandatory. A lot of the insurance companies are looking at that, the FAA is looking at that, et cetera. But we think particularly for pilots that are, that are carrying passengers, it's really, really vital that they understand what happens so we can avoid crashes like Colgan 3407 or Air France 447 and Air Asia, et cetera, which were catastrophic losses that did not have to happen. Those people should be alive today had that crew had the skills to be able to correct this problem. And Bill, can you please talk about what flight research is doing to reduce these accidents? Sure. Kathy, what we do is, first of all, flight research has a fleet of about 40 aircraft, uh, all types. And the reason that's important is because we conduct a training exercise for all types of pilots, whether it's the person flying the small prop plane or whether it's the person flying the corporate jet or the jet for the airline or helicopters. We have a fleet of helicopters as well. Critical to this kind of training, and we've looked at this, studied it, this training has to take place in an airplane. It can't take place in a simulator. There are actually examples I could show you where the pilot was trained to do a certain recovery procedure in a simulator. That condition happened in flight. He tried to apply that training. The aircraft reacted differently, and they lost the aircraft. So number one, it has to be done in an airplane. We match the pilot up with the aircraft of the type they fly. We put them through a thorough ground school to teach them the skill set. We actually profile accidents, go through them in detail, what the crew did wrong, what they should have done. And then after we do the ground school, the lectures in the classroom, we take those people up in the airplane and we actually demonstrate those upsets. So for example, um, the Air France crash was caused because the pilots put the aircraft in a full stall, didn't realize it. The aircraft dropped from 38,000 feet to the ocean in three and a half minutes and killed 229 people. We actually take the aircraft up and we show them the Air France profile and how easy it would have been to recover. So, so that's the key. The key is we demonstrate the upset, we show the student how to recover from it, the instructor does that, and then the student practices it until they perfect it. The other thing I, I might mention too is that we have incredible instructors, former astronauts, test pilots, combat veterans, guys that have had thousands of hours doing this kind of stuff, and yet humble people. 
one of our instructors had been in space three times, 39 days. And yet, if he was in the room here, you wouldn't know it because they're so humble. The other thing that we do that's, I think, really important is we create a very comfortable atmosphere for our students, and we only take them as far as they can go comfortably. We don't push an agenda if they're not comfortable. We'll take all the time with them they want. So that's what we do. Well, we were given an opportunity to see flight research at work in this Worldwide Business Field Report. Flight training is a complex endeavor that requires a comprehensive and rigorous training regimen. Unfortunately, the aviation industry has seen a dramatic rise in flight incidents due to inadequate pilot training. This increase in flight problems can be attributed to an over-reliance on simulator training, the use of automation, and the lack of emotion that comes with a limited live flight training. Flight research, based in Mojave, California, addresses this growing issue by training pilots and aircraft like the ones they will use every day. Primary value of our training is to learn to properly react to an in-flight upset condition. So the number one cause of accidents throughout the world right now is loss of control. That's been documented across uh, multiple nations, multiple agencies. And part of the problem is uh, what we call a training gap. Modern pilot training is very, very good at teaching systems and teaching regulations and things along those lines. We've lost a little something in how we train basic stick and rudder flying skills. What we have come to find is the cause of these loss of control accidents. So pilots coming here primarily learn the proper techniques for recovering from an upset so that should that ever happen to them, not only do they know the techniques, but it's also not something new. They're not as startled by it. Uh, startle factor is, is a huge issue in recovering from upsets. You know, the first time you find yourself upside down, you don't want that to be a surprise. You want that to be somewhere you've been before. And you want to understand the capabilities of the airplane. In a lot of cases, airplanes are built very, very well. We understand, as an industry, we understand aviation very, very well. And they're built, built very, very stout. So in a lot of uh, accidents and upsets, the airplane found itself in an unusual attitude, still well within the capabilities of the airplane, but since the pilot didn't know how to react, rather than bringing the airplane back to a more benign condition, actually took it to a worse condition. So we teach students what the airplanes are capable of, how to get the airplane back to that normal flight condition, and that's the primary thing that they learn how to do. Flight research not only challenges pilots with live crisis situations, but they're guided through the training by expert pilots. Many are military veterans, combat pilots, and there are even some former astronauts serving as teachers. My background is I'm a Navy pilot and former astronaut. I uh, was a test pilot for F-18 to the Navy. The flight research personnel are top notch. They're some of the best maintainers and some of the best operators I've ever had the pleasure to work with in my 30 plus year career. This course is designed to attack one of the worst problems in aviation right now, and that's loss of control in flight, which is unfortunately killing a lot of pilots and, and their passengers. So we're taking that uh, straight on and, and teaching people to handle loss of control in flight and how to get out of it. First of all, how to avoid it, how to understand what the airplanes are capable of doing, and how to react to a loss of control uh, situation. You know, most most likely an un unintentional loss of control situation, a proper response to do that. The training that we provide is training that these pilots need, and it's making uh, pilots and their operations safer across the board, and a lot of accidents could, could be avoided uh, with the type of training that we provide. Flight Research provides top-notch pilot training by offering instructors of the highest caliber with experience in high-stakes crisis situations. They buck the current trend of flight instruction that relies heavily on simulation and challenges pilots with live training and aircraft that they will actually use. Bill, thank you does not feel adequate, but please know for your service in the military, we are deeply grateful. Can you please speak about your service? Sure, I always wanted to fly, and I started out one day in Army ROTC, and. Somebody came in the room and said, Is, would anybody here like to go out to the airport and get their private pilot's license because the Army will pay for it? And I immediately raised my hands and I went out to 
the University Park Airport in Pennsylvania, took my first flight way back in the 60s. And when I graduated from Penn State, I went into the Army, initially trained as an artillery officer, because you had to be branch qualified in those days, and then went to helicopter training uh, school, Texas and then uh, Hunter Army Airfield in Georgia. And then from there, I went over to Vietnam in 1969. I was with the 1st Air Cav Division. You may have seen the famous movie, We Were Soldiers, with Mel Gibson. That's the unit I was in. I flew helicopters over there for a year. I flew over 200 combat missions. And when I came back, I decided that I wanted to fly faster jets, right? So I put in paperwork to transfer to the Air Force. I came back. I went through Air Force pilot training at Columbus, Georgia. And then I went from there. I was on active duty for about three, four years with the Air Force. The Vietnam War was winding down, so they were letting people out early if they would commit to a guard or reserve unit. So I joined a uh, guard unit in Pennsylvania and flew those airplanes uh, all over the world, literally, including uh, the fact that I was called up for Desert Storm in the early 90s. So uh, I did that as well. So I've had a wonderful flying experience, having flown all kinds of different things uh, from helicopters to supersonic jets to jet transports to turboprops and it's been a it's been a wonderful experience well thank you so much thank you i appreciate that bill please tell us more who is flight research and what do you do flight research has been around since 1981 mm -hmm. i've been with the company about five years now and flight research does very advanced training for pilots in the commercial ranks and also takes very experienced pilots and teaches them how to be uh, test pilots as well as flight test engineers. So we do that. We obviously have, in addition to that, a flight support group where we work with industries that are producing aircraft, the government and so forth, that they want to test new aircraft, weapon systems, radar systems and so forth. So we have a complete crew that is dedicated to doing all that work as well and testing out new systems that are coming out. And can you please share why it's important for the flying passenger to understand the concepts surrounding loss of control accidents? I think the big thing to understand is they shouldn't happen. These were all induced by incorrect inputs by the pilot. If the training was done properly, there would be no need to worry about this kind of thing. I can tell you that in several cases we get calls well after the fact of people being trained that are flying uh, big heavy airplanes, jets, and they say, you know what, I hit this condition the other day and except for the training I had here, I think I would have lost the aircraft. So I think what the flying public needs to understand is that I wouldn't want my family flying in an aircraft where the crew had not been trained to deal with this, had not had the skill level. They shouldn't either. And that's, that's what I think is important. And how can we know if the pilots who are flying our families have had this kind of training? Yeah, I think that it's a matter of communicating with the airlines, communicating with the private uh, carriers that fly the jets around. The, the tough thing about it is that they may say, yeah, we, we train people to do this. But in reality, there's not a lot of people that do. They might come back and say, sure, we, we show people in the simulator how to do this stuff. I can point to many accidents where people were trained in a simulator, mm -hmm. the condition happened in the aircraft, they tried to apply that, and it didn't work and they lost the aircraft. That was true with uh, Cogon 3407, it was true with American Airlines 587. So I think the flying public becoming aware of this, right. that fly every day, should, should be pushing this issue with the carriers. We chose flight research for our upset training because of their expertise, because of the type of equipment that they utilize and because of their location. The airspace is set up for this type of training. The basic difference between flight research's upset training and simulation is that simulation is theoretical. When you're in the aircraft, that is real. By being in the actual aircraft, you experience all the physiological and psychological uh, barriers that have to be overcome. The academics taught at flight research uh, are taught by professionals who live what they teach. Having said that, a student or a pilot who participates in their program can get into whatever depth of understanding their intellectual and their desire takes them to. The professionals at Flight Research live what they're teaching. Their expertise is part of who they are. Uh, the depth of their understanding of the subject matter is not limited by a simple syllabus. And therefore, the student slash pilot based on his desire and his intellect, 
can get as deep into the subject as they may choose. Can you please tell us why loss of control accidents happen? It's a condition where a structurally and mechanically sound aircraft is flying along, mm -hmm. typically on autopilot. The aircraft hits an unexpected in-flight condition. Could be weight turbulence, those kinds of things. Instantaneously when that happens, with great startle, the autopilot kicks off, the aircraft is thrown to the edge of its flight envelope, sometimes beyond its flight envelope where it was designed to fly, and also accompanied with an unusual attitude, a pitch, a roll, that kind of thing. At that moment, the pilot has a very short period of time because now he's flying it mechanically without the autopilot. No autopilot will recover an airplane in that condition. They have a very short period of time to figure out what's going on, apply the right corrective measures, and get the airplane safely back to where it should be. If they haven't been trained, chances are they're going to do the wrong thing. And can you please discuss the trend of occurrences for these accidents? It's getting worse. That's why the National Transportation Safety Board has put it on their number one most wanted list because we're not seeing an improvement. It's getting worse. Our feeling is that because of all the new pilots coming into the program, if we don't start making this training mandatory, we're going to continue to see the problem. You know, you have an accident, it's all over the news for a couple of days and everybody forgets about it. But this is a real problem and it's going to be a growing trend and we believe into the future, if we don't get this under control now, we're going to see a lot more of these accidents. And can you please explain how the training at Flight Research helps? Well, what we do at Flight Research that's very important is we, we go through a, a thorough briefing on the ground mm -hmm. and part of that briefing is to discuss uh, tools, a toolbox to use with certain upset conditions. We then talk in detail about recent accidents, why they occurred, as well as discuss other things, the flight envelope that the aircraft was designed to fly and things like that. And then we take that pilot up in an aircraft, critically, the type of aircraft they fly, and we actually demonstrate those upsets, those accidents. And then we show the proper recovery technique, we turn the aircraft over to the student after we put it in the condition again, student recovers so they practice it till they get it right. The thing about doing it in a real airplane is that you have emotion attached to it. I remember going through uh, Air Force survival school right. and you, you couldn't go to an operational unit until you went through survival school. And the second week of that survival school, you're out in the woods trying to escape and you were thrown into a POW camp. And I'm telling you, I knew I was in the US, but it was horrific, right? And I remember when the course was over, the commander of that unit saying, our studies show that unless you fully replicate the emotions required in the learning process of the skill you're trying to teach, you will never teach it to a degree of competency. That's why these things have to be done in a real airplane that feels and handles like the airplane you fly, where you feel all those emotions. If you're upside down in a real airplane, you're upside down. If you're upside down in the simulator, you can put it on hold and talk about it, not in an airplane. Mm. In the end, Flight Research provides comprehensive flight training and consequently does their part to improve overall aviation safety. This course is designed to help the pilot become better at what he does as a professional and it's designed to, if he ever finds himself in an extreme situation, to be able to get out of that extreme situation, potentially saving himself and the airplane. I think the course should be mandatory. The, the training that we provide is training that these pilots need and it's making pilots and their operations safer across the board. And a lot of accidents could be avoided with the type of training that we provide. Bill, please give us a brief overview of your program. Sure, we have several programs. We have a program for the general aviation prop pilot. Mm -hmm. We have a program for people that fly what we refer to as turboprop aircraft, which is basically a propeller on a jet engine. We have a helicopter course, because we have nine different helicopters. And we have a basic jet course, and we have an advanced jet course for people that want to experience things uh, associated with the breaking of the sound barrier and transonic flight and things like that. We select the aircraft uh, for the student, depending on what they fly. They go through extensive ground school training and then into the airplane where we do these maneuvers. In most cases, 30 different upset maneuvers uh, is what we teach them and how to recover from it. So that's generally the program uh, with great instructors and the, the typical response we get, and I mean people that have 10, 20,000 hours in airplanes, this is the best training I've ever had. Wow. That's a typical response. Does this training apply to flight attendants? 
You know, Kathy, that's a really interesting question because we were giving a presentation to a group and there happened to be flight attendants in the audience and they came up to us afterwards and said, you know, we don't want to learn how to fly the airplane and recover from upsets, right? But it would be very interesting if we could experience in the back of the aircraft the kind of things that happen when aircraft go into upsets and the chaos involved. So we said, sure, we can do that. So we actually have a course for flight attendants and we have a flight attendant that teaches it, which is pretty cool. Oh, it's wonderful. And could you please tell us a little bit about the location where your training takes place? Sure. Um, historic, historic aviation uh, skies. We're in the uh, high desert of California in Mojave and we fly in a military uh, operational area called 2508 and we share it with Edwards Air Force Base in China Lake. This is the same airspace where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947, Scott Crossfield Mach 2 in 1953. Most all of our leading military weapon systems, most all of our speed and altitude records have been set in those skies. That's the area we fly in. So if you're passionate about aviation, it's kind of cool just flying there thinking about the kind of things that happened there. And of course now Mojave is becoming sort of a center of commercial space activity with several companies that are building spacecraft. So it's, it's quite an exciting area. We say directly, as soon as the students show up, we are not teaching you to take your airplane outside of its normal flight envelope. We are teaching you to bring it back to its normal flight envelope should you find it in a bad place. A student pilot can expect a multitude of things during training. Uh, we cover everything from academics on the ground, so topics that are uh, technical in nature, but we teach them in a way that is operationally relevant. So all of our instructors have a technical background in aviation and aerospace, uh, but we also select them based on their ability to communicate those things in a practical manner. On top of that, we also have chosen aircraft that are similar to what our students fly in real life. To make an analogy to a car, uh, you know, if you typically drive a you know, uh, a sedan, you, you drive a smaller car, you'd want to learn on a smaller type car. If you trip, typically drive a bus, you'd want to learn to drive a bus or learn to do any kind of maneuvering in a bus rather than a car. We do the same thing. We teach in large airplanes and students get to do maneuvers that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do in jet-powered airplanes uh, at, their, at their home facility and their home aircraft and so they get to see things here that they can't see anywhere else and learn skills that they can't learn anywhere else. We are the national leader uh, in upset recognition recovery training uh, and that's, uh, that's by design. We've taken a great deal of care in, in understanding what the needs are of our customers and we've chosen aircraft instructors and curriculum that meet those needs quite well. You shared that your graduates say that this is the best training that they've ever received. How does that make you feel? You know, it makes me feel very good. I, I, uh, I debrief um, every student that comes through there. And we had three different classes last week. And the thing that they all complimented us on was not only how great the training was, mm -hmm. but the spirit of our team and the culture we have in the business that makes everybody feel comfortable and they just really enjoy hanging around with us and doing these things. And in fact, the next day I got in front of the team and I, I talked about that because I said, you know, we've developed a very unique culture here and our students really appreciate it and it's because you guys are so helpful with everything they need. How would you describe your culture? From a military background, it, it's sort of like a squadron culture mm -hmm. where you have a bunch of guys that are, that are flying airplanes, women now too. You sort of all love to fly and you can't wait to fly, and then after the flight's over, you all hang out with each other and talk about the flying in a really comfortable, relaxed way. It's funny because uh, having been in the military for so long, my best friends are guys that I flew with in the military. They're brothers to me, mm -hmm. and I see them four or five times a year. That's the kind of camaraderie you, you develop in aviation, and I think, we've, uh, I think we have that kind of a relaxed culture that we've developed in Mojave. And can you please tell us how the insurance industry views your training? Yeah, we've called on all the major underwriters that uh, underwrite aviation insurance. They're all very enthusiastic about it. They all endorse us. Um, many of them provide a premium discount for those who have who've come through it. 
it's really the insurance industry that controls the type of training that is done. While they endorse us, what we're trying to do is get the insurance companies to say, hey, look, this ought to be mandatory because if you lose one aircraft, other than the pain and suffering, which is horrific, the cost could be billions of dollars for one accident, right? Sure. So uh, they wholly endorse it. Well, as we wrap up, Bill, can you please talk about where people can learn more about flight research? Sure. They can go to our website, flightresearch.com, and they can pull up all the information there. There are several videos that actually show maneuvers that we do of the aircraft itself. I might mention that every student that comes through the program, when we do our flights, there's a three camera system on the airplane along with uh, communications so you can hear the instructor talking to the student and you can see what the aircraft is doing from three different views. They take that back with them so when they want to review things they can, they can go to their family and say, see I was a fighter pilot for a day, I was doing all this stuff. That is where they can find out and if they have questions they can feel free to call me directly or any of our staff and we're happy to uh, answer any questions they may have. Wonderful. Well, Bill, it certainly seems that flight research is passionate about leading the charge for aviation safety through real life training experiences. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining it's great us to be here, today. Kathy. Thank you. For Worldwide Business, I'm Kathy Ireland. Thank you for watching. <laughs>